Good morning. Good morning. So my name's uh, Kirby Cundiff. I'm microphone. Ah, oh, thank you. Is this thing detachable? Yes, it is. Excellent. So uh, my name is Kirby Cundiff. I'm currently working for the University of Maryland University College. I'm the chair of their online graduate financial management program. I did grow up in uh, Missouri. Grew up in Kirksville, been a member of the Libertarian Party here since the late 80s. And since then I've wandered around quite a bit. Um, I got my undergraduate at Truman State back in Northeast Missouri, MS and PhD. Oh, some Truman people? All right. <laughs> yeah. Got my uh, MS and PhD from the University of Illinois. I think there's Champaign Urbana people here too. All right. And also, I'm a chartered financial analyst and a certified financial planner. While I'm currently a finance professor, I have a master's in finance. My PhD is actually in theoretical physics. And, yeah. Close enough. Close enough, right. It's all, all applied math. And I've written for a lot of different libertarian uh, think tanks, uh, American Institute for Economic Research, Fee Foundation for Economic Education, Mises Institute, uh, Independent Institute, a few other organizations. Uh, most of this talk is from an article with the Mises Institute, and it's available online. I've also got copies of a bunch of different articles over there on a table on this topic and several others for those who are interested. Um, so this sort of overlaps academic material and sort of general education material, um, general background of how Social Security was developed, and how the formulas, which are a lot like the tax code, very complicated and change regularly, have changed over the years on how they take your money and then how now they basically avoid giving your money back. So uh, initially the people that first got in this, actually it was very appealing to them. They made a really high rate of return. Uh, most of you in this room will get a pretty negative rate of return. So you may get some money back, but probably less than you pay in. Uh, so um, let's see, if we go back to 1935, it was a Roosevelt initiative, try and pace back and forth on different sides of this thing. Um, it was made compulsory to participate in it, at least for some people in 35. Initially farmers and some other businesses were exempt. Uh, the first checks were one big cash check, and then later on they started doing them in monthly retirement checks. And the first person to get one of these did very well. A Mrs. Ida May Fuller in Vermont paid $25, lived to 100, and received $22,000 in benefits. I have family. Yes, she did okay. <laughs> but he does grow on trees. If you're right place, right time. Was that pre-inflation? Uh, yeah. <laughs> that is pre-inflation. Still pretty good deal. Yeah. At the time it was passed, there was a lot of resistance to this among the libertarians, I guess, of the day, commonly referred to now as the old right. And there's a pretty good discussion of the authors I refer to in this, uh, both on things like the Mises Institute webpage and then Brian Dougherty did a good book called Radicals for Capitalism that discusses a lot of these. And one of the writers at that point in time was Garrett Garrett. And, um, he referred to this as, a, as since the domestication of the individual and went through a lot of Roosevelt's activities and basically said they make no sense except from the point of view of they get more and more control over people. So you go back a hundred years ago, a large fraction of the population were independent farmers, small business owners, and gradually everybody's got more and more into the system where you pretty much all work for the government or a big corporation now. Few entrepreneurs out there, but not, not nearly as many as there used to be. And he just looked at this as part of the system to force everybody into that. Other authors of the day, um, if you're a fan of Little House on the Prairie, um, the daughter in that, Rose Wilder Lane, was pretty libertarian. And she edited and rewrote a lot of those books. Her mother came up with the initial ideas, but she basically did a lot of the final drafts from it. Her quotes on it were things like, true social security is canned vegetables and slaughtered pigs in your cellar, which seems pretty reasonable. 
And she and another um, author at that time, Isabella Patterson, both refused to accept anything from the Social Security system. They wouldn't basically even open the Social Security cards. They were compulsory um, issued. Obviously, it affected both of their careers. Um, Isabella was, I guess, as, as later on, was fired from her job. Here's a nice uh, quote for Rose Wilder Lane. Uh, she was responding to a, I guess it was a radio commentator asked for listeners' comments on Social Security, and she put it on an outside of a postcard, which was then read by the NSA at the, the, that point in time, the U.S. Postal Service. And the quote was, if uh, American school teachers say to German Nazi children, we believe in Social Security, the children were asked, then why did you fight Germany? All these Social Security laws are German, instituted by Bismarck, and expanded by Hitler. Americans believe in freedom and not being taxed for their own good, bossed by bureaucrats. So the local postmaster general read this, reported it to the FBI, oh, <laughs> and the state trooper was sent out to investigate. Um, she politely invited him in and served him cookies, but then wrote an article about it. Uh, what is this, the Gestapo, basically? Uh, question for not liking Roosevelt. And Isabella Patterson had a similar experience. She lost her job over this at the Boston Herald. Uh, she wasn't bitter about it. She basically said they kept me on a lot longer than anybody else would. But, you know, and uh, like, uh, again, like uh, Rose Wilder Lane, she didn't participate in the system at all. After she was died, she hadn't even opened the mail from the Social Security that had the card in it. And at least had enough money after that to live, I guess, somewhat independently. I think uh, both of them tried to keep their salary low enough um, that they wouldn't have to pay in to Social Security. I think at that point in time, it didn't start from dollar one. I'm not sure about that. So, interesting past. Uh, the way your benefits are now determined is a formula that looks sort of U.S. tax code-ish. Uh, this is the PIA benefits formula. Try and pace back and forth so I don't stand in front of people. And a lot of people talk about means testing Social Security. Well, it's already means tested. It's just means tested in ways most people don't understand. So the, one of the ways they means test it is by how much benefit you get into this thing they call the PIA formula. And the more money you make, the less benefit you get. So for the first 90% or you get a 90% benefit for the first $895 of average lifetime monthly income. Um, the way they actually do this now is they average your top 35 years of income during your life and come out with a dollar amount. And if that dollar amount is 895 or below, you get a pretty good benefit. So I guess if you think in your entire life, your average monthly income is going to be 895 or below, you might do okay with this. Of course, even if you make that little money, you make it over 35 years, then after 35 years, you wouldn't get that much benefit from it. If you make above $895 a month, which most people do, then your benefit is decreased to only 32%. And if you make above 5,000 average a month, then 15%. And of course, uh, Social Security is still into trouble, so they're talking about adding a 5% bracket. And just like um, you know, everything with the tax code, there used to be like four or five of these formulas. So they shrink them, they expand them, they shrink them, they expand them. And you can go on to the Social Security website, log in. They will give you your entire payment history for your entire life. And I went through and developed a nice big Excel formula to figure out exactly how they calculated all this stuff. Yeah, lots of fun. So again, this has been changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, one of the things they do, of course, is they keep expanding the number of years that are averaged. And for a lot of people, you may have a lot of zeros in there. So I and other PhDs stayed in grad school until we were close to 30. Um, at that point in time, we didn't have to pay Social Security on that, so that's a bunch of zeros. I worked overseas in Dubai for a few years, so that's a bunch of zeros. And you average those in, and of course, that will decrease the amount you pay out. So the number of years averaged in this um, used to be around 23 
uh, for Americans born in 1917, and then they increased it for to 29 for Americans born in 23, and 35 for Americans born today or several years, or Americans retiring today, I should say. And there were several other years in there. I don't remember exactly what year they altered it. Currently, it's being discussed, um, now averaging that over 38 or 40 years to further cut benefits, decrease it. So again, if you have years in there you weren't working, puts it down. One way of doing it. So you don't do nearly as well as Ida. Um, they're also changing the retirement age. Um, those of you who are younger in here, uh, my age or younger, you're certainly going to not be retiring at 65, but at 67. And to actually get the full benefits of the system, you have to wait till age 70. So you can retire as early as 62, but then they cut, I think it's 8% a year in benefits for every year under full retirement. And you get an increase for every year after full retirement up to age 70. So the longer you wait, the more paychecks you get, but then your life expectancy goes down. Also, of course, the amount of money taxed by Social Security is increased on a regular basis. Initially, you're only your first $3,000 of income was taxed in 1937, so you'd be taxed up to that point, and then zero FICA taxes above it. By 1980, that increased to close to 26,000. They just increased it drastically, like by around 20,000 in the last two, two or three years, and it's now up to the first 128,000. So what? Yeah, you. Most people don't fall into that. Yeah, most people fall into that. And of course, one of the current proposals is again to make that up to infinity. Uh, right now, the <laughs> Medicare taxes go from zero to infinity, but Social Security's capped at 128. So most people will fall under it. And then if you don't fall under that, of course, your, uh, your federal income taxes will go up above that as your FICA taxes drop out. So, in a sense, they get either way. And the tax rate, of course, has been increased year after year after year. It was only 2% in 37 of your income they took. Then it was up to 9 in 1980 and 10.98 in today. So, and there are proposals, of course, for further increasing that. And that's just the portion that goes to old age disability social security. There is also the Medicare tax of 2.9 above that and a disability insurance tax above that. And again, this caps out at the 128, this goes up to infinity. All the Medicare stuff. With all of this, um, the system is basically, of course, insolvent. Uh, commonly, when they calculate the national debt, which we all know is quite high, they do not do that calculation like General Motors or anybody running a pension plan is required to. So if you just look at the national debt per citizen, it's only 212000 that each of you owe. Now, if you include the unfunded mandate of Social Security, this one's done per family, it's 830000 So each family would have to pay this into the system before there'd actually be enough money to finance pulling the money back out of the system, which isn't really practical. And this is all from the U.S. debt clock available on. So, as obviously the system is not, as obvious the question is, the system is not very solvent. Uh, Ronald Reagan actually, well, he cut taxes in other areas. Um, he had a blue ribbon commission with Alan Greenspan and other people on it that increased taxes the last time to supposedly solve Social Security for all time. That clearly didn't work. And the current trend, at least this is the Heritage Foundation's calculations, is the funds will be exhausted in not too many years, 2024, then they will have to, again, make more adaptations to it. So there are a few years of more solvency and then back down. And of course, there are lots of further added, um, adaptions on the system to further cut the amount of money you're going to get. So. Kirby, wasn't the, didn't, when Reagan increased the amount that was, you know, the Social Security tax, right? Uh -huh. And then, and it wasn't it put into a trust fund? Supposedly, it's always yeah. been in a trust fund. Yeah, but the trust fund doesn't have any money in it. Right. 
Yeah. Well, the, the trust fund has government data. Yeah, the trust fund has basically has I, IOUs in it. So they basically, the idea was we're going to increase this to make it solvent. We're going to put it in a trust fund, but then the politicians immediately started stealing the money from the trust fund yep. in effect to pay for current spending because they couldn't stop themselves. Yeah, and that was done under Reagan. That was done yeah. under Johnson. Actually, Roosevelt did that pretty much from the beginning of the system. Right. So it's just we're going to take the money from one place, yeah, spin yeah, it another place. I think Johnson it became part of the general budget. Yep, I think that may have been the case. Yeah, yeah. and then they may have done accounting to separate it back out and just. Yeah. So they didn't stick it in mason jars and bury it in the backyard. <laughs> Apparently not. No. <laughs> Damn, I'm so disappointed. Yep. So it's been a Ponzi scheme since day one. Pretty much from the beginning. I always like the libertarian comedian Tim Slagle's line on that, where he's teaching uh, the kids about taxes on Halloween and put the candy on the top shelf and save it for your retirement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a good skit. Yeah, but then, and then the grandparents come and eat it. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, that's what happens. Save it on the top shelf and save for retirement, and then your grandparents come to eat it. Yes. So um, this was actually a nice response when I wrote this article for the Mises Institute. Somebody else posted this up, and I thought it was quite appropriate. So, <laughs> the comment section. So of course, we've cut Social Security benefits and increased taxes pretty continuously since the 70s. They were borrowing before that. There are a ton more cuts basically on the table. They're trying to figure out how can we at least extend out the appearance of solvency. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that I guess from a libertarian perspective I don't find as offensive as others is increasing the retirement age. I'd sort of prefer that because it in a sense gets people out of the system. Uh, my guess is that's not as popular with the politicians. Instead, they're proposing more things like the universal basic income where we all get a check from the government, but that at least has calculations associated with it. The other ones would be, of course, further cutting benefits. Instead of averaging only 35 years, do 38 or 40. Um, right now, I, depending on your income, there's all sorts of restrictions of getting Social Security before your full retirement age. If your income is above a certain level, they take half of it, and then they tax the rest of it. So you only get, um, well, your benefits are reduced well, you're below age 67 by 8% each year. If your income is enough above, I think it's 14 or 20,000 or something a year, then you actually only get half the money anyway. And I think on the age 67, they reduce it by a third, and then you can be taxed from 50 to 85% of what you get after that, and that goes on for the rest of your life. So they may increase those numbers from 50 to 85 for everything or make it all fully taxable. There's other proposals to decrease the coefficients, give you less benefit for what you pay in. And again, most likely politicians are more likely to go for stuff like this, add another bin point at 5%, because this kind of stuff nobody understands. All right? Makes sense. Whereas increasing the retirement age, people are going to notice. Well, you're more likely to do things no one understands. And then the really sneaky thing that's been done quite a while is redefining inflation. Yeah. And politicians have been pretty good at redefining inflation. Yeah. Um, you go back to the Roman Empire, um, Nero, etc., uh, would melt down, they tax the people in silver or gold, and then they'd melt down the silver and they'd mix some other base metal in it, and they'd spend it, and they'd claim it was still silver. So you can actually buy Roman coins for $20 because there's tons of them out there from the later emperor period, but then they're actually pure silver in the Republic and some of the early emperor period. It's a little bit more, well, in a sense, it's easier today. You don't have to melt down any coins. Um, you just redefine, well, okay, Social Security's index for inflation. Let's redefine inflation. <laughs> and you go to the store, you may not notice. So this is the shadow stats, which is a bunch of economists that obviously don't like the government real well. And they do recalculations of the way the US government used to calculate things like inflation, the unemployment rate, all sorts of government statistics that they've redefined on a pretty regular basis. So back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had really high inflation of 15%. Um, late 80s. 
they started redefining it. This came out of the Ronald Reagan Blue Ribbon Commission to cure Social Security with Alan Greenspan on it. He had a pretty good idea of how to redefine inflation, so they did. And Shadow Stats recalculates the inflation rate the way they used to, where, which is in blue up here. The red line is the way they do it now. And you can see there's a pretty good gap here. So what kind of things did they do? They introduced a basket of goods estimate, and it basically says if one thing goes up in price a lot, for example, steak, well, people substitute something else like hamburger. And that really doesn't affect your lifestyle, who prefers steak over hamburger, so that's not inflation. And they also then later put in hedonic corrections, hedonism as in the, in this case, the quality of a good, and they might say something like, well, this year's Honda Accord costs more than last year's, but it really doesn't because it's a different car and it's nicer, so its price actually went down. Yeah. So you put in a lot of corrections like that, and you can change the inflation rate. And that, of course, is um, set to index not only your social security checks, but also your tax brackets. So they started introducing, strangely around this time period, indexing the tax brackets to inflation, well, that's a pretty good incentive to redefine inflation. So you can still have that bracket creep like they discussed back then. And here's a more recent graph um, of the same sort of data. Uh, blue and the orange are the ones currently being used. And they're discussing, again, introducing yet another CPI that's a little bit lower than the current one. So they can really alter it every few years. Social Security does do regular calculations on how they can get the system to last longer. And there's a ton of these on the ssa.gov page. So this is an example of what if we increase the maximum amount of people's income taxed from 128 to infinity. And actually, they do raise quite a bit more money doing that. It extends time periods on out. So solvency period. Increasing, oh, sorry. That's that. I'm seeing different things here than there. Increasing the retirement age just to 68 doesn't have much of an impact. You'd have to stick it up to 70 or higher probably to have a big impact on that. Most people do take their retirement benefits early, 62, 63. Um, surveys, of course, say one of the reasons for that is they don't trust the system. But then you are penalized pretty heavily for taking it early. So, trade off. Yeah. Some ideas the Cato Institute pushes in libertarian circles, uh, privatizing the system. And Chile is famous for this. And Chile, I think, is now the wealthiest country in South America. And they have done pretty well. They obviously get a much higher rate of return on their system than the Social Security system does. Uh, but anytime you do something like that, and it gives government basically more of the ability to buy private equities, then, of course, they're going to try and influence the private equities. And I give, I guess, two lower examples of that. Uh, recently, the Illinois treasurer, who controls all the Illinois' 529 accounts, which are um, basically tax-deferred or tax-free accounts for people to save for their child's education, well, since he controls those people's money, he will try and pressure companies with basically somebody else's money. And the government controls it. And he was writing Facebook trying to get them to get rid of fake news. So he's basically saying, I control all these people's money. I can at least buy or sell it if I want to. You may not be able to vote the shares, but I will sell your stock if you don't do what I tell you to. And Cowper's is notorious for this, the big California teachers uh, fund. They particularly make sure they divest in any company that sells guns. And of course, there was the, um, the divestiture of South African movement. Now there's some discussion of um, Israel, those sort of topics. And anytime you stick a government agency controlling this stuff, they're going to take your money. They're going to use it in one way or another to try and further influence companies. 
Um, preparing for this, uh, for the CFP exam, I have to do 30 hours of continuing education credit every two years. So I started going through one of their social security training things. And one thing I hadn't known before is you can also lose your social security benefits for traveling to certain places. Yep. In particular, if you go to uh, North Korea or Cuba, well, you're not allowed to collect social security. Uh, so it, 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 you completely lose the money for those countries. And there's a whole list of other countries during the time period you're there, you're not allowed to collect your benefits. But after you come back to the US, you're supposed to get them. So if you're overseas for 30 days or more, in general, they say, no, I'm not sure how they would necessarily know you're overseas for 30 days. But of course, passport tracking systems are getting better. And then they're supposed to freeze your social security. Once you get back to the US, you're allowed to get it. So as mentioned, I've written on a lot of different topics. Here's a list of, I guess, different topics at different institutes. Um, all discussed today. You can just search my name online at all these different think tanks and find stuff. Or there is a bunch of, I guess, hard copies over there for those who are interested in them. And if anybody has any questions, happy to try and answer them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so your, your mention of traveling to Cuba, did that, did that predate the opening up of Cuba? I actually don't know. Of course, the, uh, the rules in Cuba, my understanding is it's still technically illegal to go there. Obama just said he wouldn't enforce the rules. And we actually went there last year. Now, well, you are in... And does that mean that you don't collect Social Security while you're no, there? No, in, in, in the case of Cuba, they're actually... Um, yeah, it wouldn't be forever, but during if you spend a month there, you're supposed to lose a check for that month. And you're never supposed to be able to get that money back. And of course, they could still uh, fine you. Still, it's like a five thousand dollar fine for Americans to visit Cuba unless you have government approval. If it's for education or something, now Obama waived that. Don't know if it'll come back or not. Yeah, I keep harping on offering concrete solutions or proposals for how we get from where we are to where it is we want to be. Yep. And elimination of Social Security is not float as yep. a boat that will not float. Tweaking the thing, like you had one side up there that we changed the 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 vectors or whatever a half percent that's just tweaking and that doesn't seem appealing do you have have you figured out what how you would do something because people are not going to let old people lay in the gut sure but well, that ain't going to happen how, what do you, do you have a proposal for how you think we should deal with provide a safety net yeah um my favor in something like social security it is an actual contract that people have signed into not necessarily voluntarily so i would prefer probably cutting other parts of the budget to try and shore it up a little bit and gradually do things like increase the retirement age and maybe get encouragements for people somehow to have other retirement income. Um, oh, yeah. I'm okay, frankly, with things like further means testing it and making it more into a, you know, in a sense, a welfare program. You do have a problem. The thing is bankrupt. How do you deal with the bankruptcy? And you can't, they're probably not going to declare bankruptcy and these people get something. But naturally, being you know, more libertarian oriented, anything that gets people gradually out of the system without hurting people who are dependent on too much, I would favor. Most people uh, I talk to who are, say, under 40 years old don't expect to get anything yeah. at retirement. Um, I don't know, so how about the idea of phasing it out if you're under 40? stop paying into it and yeah I, I'd be fine with that and try and shore it up with other systems again obviously the, the government is more interested in getting people into the system than out of the system the overall reaction from people is pretty positive about that yeah I think young people would be quite happy with it most of them because you know Social Security it, it's hard to make a worse investment than that there are people that do, but there aren't that many of them. You have to you know, find the person that's actually more irresponsible than the federal government. Yeah. Say what? Government bonds. Yeah, yeah. But, but they actually probably give you, not necessarily with inflation, but they're going to give you at least your principal back and a little bit more. The odds are this will give you less than your principal back. So. Well, I found that my employers now um, whether I do anything at all will automatically um, start putting some of my money into a retirement account. Yeah. yeah, something like that. Um, 
when I was in New York State, they, they forced me to put in 7.5% regardless, because it was based on my salary. Um, whereas in most states, most the other states I've been in, like Florida and Missouri, they, they put in 3% and then you can go up. Um, but I mean, it, isn't that kind of a, to some extent, a, a better way, which sure. is which is to tell people, okay, you have to save for retirement, but you choose to <coughs> give it to. Yep. And if it, those were individual accounts you controlled and right. the government was voting. Yeah. And of course, um, until the last couple of decades, uh, most at least many state employees did not have to participate in Social Security. I work for Los Alamos National Lab, which is managed by the University of California, so when I was an estate employee, I had exactly what you're talking about. I had the right to take the money that would go into Social Security instead and stick it into a retirement account. <laughs> I wish I'd gone that with the state of New York, right? <laughs> and a lot of them don't do that anymore. I know Missouri isn't, the teachers here have to pay them both. <clears throat> so they don't. Yep. Yeah. Keep saying Social Security, it's OASDI. Yeah. And I think the most abuse happens with the DI. Yeah. I do probably six, seven hundred tax returns a year. And I know a lot of people in Springfield, Missouri area are getting Social Security <coughs> checks and over near 60. And they're running construction companies on the side, auto dealerships, yep. control companies, and all this other stuff. Yep. I mean, how much is that sort of they're not disabled. No, they're, they're not. Control company or construction company. I, I agree with you. Um, and in fact, my brother um, is an attorney that proce uh, processes a lot of those. And I think they usually take 18 months to process, and he gets then a third of the money for going through the system. And my guess is uh, a lot of his cases, of course, that are disability turn into bankruptcy. And I think a lot of those, whether you get it or not, is going to have a lot more to do with your perseverance than whether you're disabled. Yeah. Now, given the accounting, I'm not sure how good a job the government does in keeping the system separate. Probably not very good, but in theory, this goes to Social Insecurity, our OASI, and then the uh, 1.42 that's added on top of that goes into the disability program. Now, I don't know, I guess I haven't looked really at the solvency of this and what money goes in or out of it separate from the you're right. I, I, I personally know several people that don't seem disabled at all that are on that system. I guess he yeah, had you first, but yeah. Oh, maybe that answered my question, but the 10.98%, the does, that, does that include the uh, employer contribution? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so half of this comes from your side of the paycheck, oh. half comes from theirs, and the same with each of these numbers. And then, of course, on top of this now under Obamacare, for people over, is it a quarter of a million, they pay extra on top of that onto Medicare. So what comes out of your paycheck, you divide each of these numbers by two, and then your employer has to match it. Unless you're self-employed, which you get to do all of it, of course. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Greg? <laughs> we have given two people our presidential nomination twice, yep. Harry Brown and Gary Johnson. Harry Brown's proposal was, he would say to people, what government program are you willing to do without in exchange for giving up Social Security? Was that? And then the other half of it was selling off land yep. and such government assets in order to fund Social Security. Yep. Um, what, president, what presidential candidate had to, because they all have to deal with this issue, who dealt with it best, do you think, from a libertarian perspective? Um, well. I, I guess of the ones you've listed, certainly Harry Brown was the far more libertarian than Gary Johnson, so I would probably say his proposals. And of course, the only time the U.S. debt was ever paid off was by Andrew Jackson, and he did it by selling land. And the Fed still own out west, I think, nationwide, it's like a third of the United States. You yeah. could raise money from that, I mean, but the problem is what would they really do with it? So if you actually had somebody dedicated towards getting rid of government programs, that would be a great way of raising money. Um, again, a possible proposal, phasing this out for young people, for people over a certain age, 60 or whatever, buying private annuities for them, financed through land sales. These are all, all possible ideas. So question one. Yes, please. I, got, I guess, oh, yeah, no worries. Yeah. So question on uh, phasing it out for young people and all that. Um, 27, if I, you know, and if under 40 or something, if you're not paying in, mm -hmm. what's that going to do to the, to the solvency if it's not getting that income from those people? What's that going to do? Of course, yeah, it, it's, it's insolvent. The question is how you deal with the insolvency. 
So if, you, if young people don't have to pay into it, you've got to figure out some way of basically paying out the liabilities on the other side. But pretty much nobody, no matter what you do, you're in a bankrupt situation. How do you deal with it? Yeah. 40 years of liabilities that don't. Yeah, it's not going to be covered. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be, and maybe still is, possible on your tax return to, to earmark a trivial amount of money for the presidential debate commission or whatever. How about if, um, how about if in exchange for being out of the system, you were, or maybe anyone could earmark up to a certain huge fraction of their income tax return for Social Security and cover the insolvency, insolvency during the, the phase out? It's, it's certainly an option, yeah. Yeah, of course, any proposal like this, the question is, who comes into office after that? Do they actually stick with it? Yeah, no. Like the caps that were put on military spending from a few years ago, they're all ignoring now, et cetera. Yeah. 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 There, do you know if there's been an increase? You know, he talked about the disability side. Has there been an increase in the percentage? If you look at the, if you look at the total funds paid out each year, what percentage of that is disability and what percentage is retirement? Or the disabilities going up. I don't have set data, but the anecdotal stuff I've heard is um, as they phased out welfare programs and everybody became disabled. Became disabled. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.